the Endurance Asia podcast. I know we tell the truthful story if they ever ask. Stop the complaining because things ain't that bad. Abby. Yo. Yo. <laughs> It's good to have you on the Endurance Asia podcast. Thanks for coming and joining us. Thanks, man. It's good to be here. Yeah, we're in a great little setting. We're on the East Coast. Uh, it's a good spot, surrounded by runners. We've got the uh, Sundown Marathon that's going to be kicking off. Uh, it's actually, t- it kicks off tomorrow Tomorrow night, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. um, so, yeah, so pleased to have you come and, uh, come and join the podcast, mate. You're, we had the, the queen of uh, ultra running in, uh, in oh, Singapore no. just the other week with Jerry Chua. We've now got the king no, of ultra running. No, 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 no. no. Um, but, yeah, you've had a crazy <laughs> year so far, right? You've had an absolutely crazy year. Yeah, I had. I mean, I've I mean, survived Hong Kong 4 Trail and uh, did the dragon's back and then I got one more big one coming in October you've got another big one yeah, yeah. so I mean I, I think we we'd met before in uh, in Singapore and I think you guys had um, yeah. had met when Jim Walsley were in town yeah. Rick, Rick yep. and, uh, and you had met um, but uh, but yeah we've uh, I, I, we saw you on the four trails on, on multiple occasions but but I was so keen to to get <laughs> to meet with you this week because you're fresh off the back <laughs> yeah, of, uh, of dragon's <laughs> back so yeah, yeah so we I mean let's should we start with dragon's back and then yeah, we, can, we, we can rerun the clock a bit but you're you're what now five days out from finishing or no a week I guess it was five yeah, days a week, about, a week, about a week yeah um so talk us through it a little bit so you when did you first hear about the race what was it that okay, attracted took, you to it I heard about this race two years ago and then did a bit of background check and I found out that the first race that was held was in 1992 okay supported by the uh, British army and then the next one if I'm not wrong was held in 2012 after that 2015 2017 yeah. And then 2019. So this is the fifth edition. And this is this is the the Burger House Dragons Back Race. Yeah, they, it they is. bill it as the what do they say that the hardest, toughest, toughest multi-stage fi- ultra in the in the world. In the world. Mm-hmm. And so it's a, it's a race that runs sort of along the spine of Wales. Yep, correct. So in you the UK. Yeah. so you run through the spine of uh, Conway, Wales, run through all the major mountains. Okay, I can't seem to pronounce some of the Welsh name. I remember Bricken, Black Mountains, Penny Farm. Uh, Grip Gorge, that was the epic. Yeah, I don't know, I don't we, I don't know if we can help. Well, yeah, don't Snowden you? Is, yeah, of course. Yeah, we do yeah, Snowden, yeah. Bricken. So this is the epic. So one of my friends who registered together with me, he panicked like a couple of days before the race and then he decided to Google toughest multi-stage races and then he went through the list and then he realized number one was Dragon's Back. <laughs> And then yeah. I said, yeah, mate, we sign up for this. Let's get it done. And so on that list would be Marathon de Sable, yep, uh, the Four Deserts. Yep. Um, uh, there was one in Iceland as well, I think. I can't remember what is it called. Okay. Yeah, it's not the one where you swim and run, is it? No, There's no, a crazy it's not. One. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, I was there when we, when we went running with Jim Wormsley. And yeah. I think one of the guys, you told one of the guys you're doing Dragon's Back. And I think he thought you meant... That Kong. section of the Hong Kong Trail <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that you were building up to a big 10k, yeah. kind of knocking off the end of Hong Kong Trail, but uh, no, it's very different. So yeah, what attracted me to it was that when I did a bit of homework on the trails on the on the Dragon's Back, I realized none of the, no Singaporeans has ever done it before. So I'm usually attracted to those kind of stuff, and no Singaporeans have, has ever contemplated or ever did it before, and also it's rated as one of the toughest ultra in the world. So I'm kind of attracted to those kind of stuff, and not many people have completed where the DNF rates are very high and not many Singaporeans have completed and it's, it's the toughest one. So I decided to put my name and see how it goes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, was that the first time you'd been racing in the UK, in Europe? or what, What's first your experience over there? First time in the UK. First time, okay. Yeah, I've raced in Europe before. I did my TDS a um, couple okay. of years back. So in Europe and UK, yeah, that's the first time. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so that, that kicked off on, that was five days starting on the Monday. Yep. And uh, talk us through it. So, so first okay. day was... First day, everybody gathers at the castle. Conway Castle, beautiful place. And then you got the Welsh uh, choir singing. And then we had the 2017 Martin Sconey coming, giving us a motivational speech. And then we saw a Singapore flag flying up at top of the castle. Amongst the other flag, it was on the top. And then we said, that's a sign, man. <laughs> you know, we got to fly the flag high. <laughs> and then went off with the start. But the start, do- the start doesn't start once you're off the, once you exit the castle. You need to get out of the castle. I think about two kilometers out, where you, where you, where you, where you put in your spot in then, I then into a chip, and then that, it, and then it starts off, and then you're off to a roaring start. So the way it starts is they always encourage the slower runners to take the front, while the faster runners are at the back. 
So because it creates a huge gem along the castle walls. So you said you said just before we started talking, there was about 400 something people. Yeah, we started off with about 499 people. By the end of five days, we had about 210 or 207 people. Wow, yeah. so it was uh, it got chipped away at over those five days. Yeah. So day, day one, you said, was one of the harder days? Yeah, day one is one of the hardest days because there's a lot of technical climbing, a lot of rocks, boulders. So especially after the first support point, we had to go up to Grip Gorge. Yeah, that was epic, man. I mean, it was epic, Grip Gorge. If you've seen some of the videos up there. But I was excited because I read so much about Grip Gorge. I was excited to go up there and see what is this Grip Gorge all about. And so, what's the terrain underfoot? Is it really rocky? It's, it's rocky. It's yeah. rocky. And some, part, some parts of the trail you had to do like practically on your hands and feet and it, you're climbing, rock climbing. And how, so how are you feeling at this point? Are you thinking, okay, I've, um, this, is, this is what I thought it was going to be. I'm ready for this. Or are you thinking, I haven't trained for this kind of terrain? Oh, that thought didn't occur to me. I was yeah. just excited to be there. Yeah. And uh, I was just going at a pace where I'm very comfortable. Just enjoying myself on the technical trails. I kind of enjoy running on technical trails. So that I felt a sense of fulfillment going up there. And, and then I said, well, I'm here. Yeah. I'm at the moment just savor the moment and then enjoy the trails yeah and so so the first day finishes what sort of time are you looking at how, how long are you on your feet for in the first about day? 10 hours and 20 minutes okay so the my my strategy for each day was between 10 to 30 hours because before the race start i set a target of 50 hours okay because i said yeah. 50 hours that's the target time i want to set so first day i hit about 10 30 because the last section i said i need to slow down a bit so i slowed down i ran with a couple of uh, uk guys just chatting with them and then we finished together yeah, so second day was equally tough, but slightly longer. Elevation gain was about 3,000 plus. What was the cutoff um, on each day then? So it's a 6 a.m. start every okay, morning? Okay, so first day we start at 7 a.m. Okay. And the cutoff is 2,300 hours. So Got you. After that is a 6 a.m. start and then 2,300 hours. So the later you finish each day, the earlier you get to start. However, you're given, you are given the option to start earlier or later, up to you. Yeah. Yeah. And do they? How do they stagger it? Because obviously they can't have everyone going off. So they exactly they the have a time. they have a system where they have already calculated all the split and timing. So based on that, they give you a recommended start time. So okay. if you're coming in about 12, 13 hours, usually recommended start time is about 6 a.m. Okay. Yeah. So if you're coming in like 10 hours, they'll tell you, okay, you can start about eight to nine. God. Yeah. And what what was the sort of level of competition like? When you are you watching a lot of guys go past you, or are you feeling pretty confident about your? A level of your fitness or yeah, yeah i was pretty confident I, mean, I can't compare myself with the elites elites were crazy the way they were running it was phenomenal but but i was pretty confident in my level of fitness the amount of training that i put in that i can actually maintain a pace between 10 to 10 30 hours every day yeah yeah and equipment and nutrition were holding up at this point you were everything was fine yeah everything was fine i was on tailwind and yum butter that was my two stuff that i was uh, depending on yeah they, 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 and then i had amino vital as well that I took halfway at the support point. I didn't depend on any solid fuels. It's just these two items. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they work pretty well during Hong Kong four trails. So I just, yeah, just uh, uh, use them as well. Yeah, and, and obviously a bit of a different challenge to four trails. So yeah, self-supported, long kind of longer distance, no breaks at, at, at four trails. Yeah. And this is a this is your first stage. Your first yeah, stage my race? very first stage multi-stage. So it's interesting because so. The conversation I had with my friend was that, you know, multi-stage, at least you get to rest every day, have a good meal every night, and then have a good rest, and then you start. But the one thing we were mentally prepared for is the effect that it will have every day on your body when you wake up in the morning. So my effects was not so pronounced. I didn't have much muscle soreness or everything, so which was pleasantly surprised. So every day I just kept going and going and going. And for, for a multi stage, were you getting in every night and did you have like a specific routine that you'd set out for yourself? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. you're like, get in, just change, shower straight away, get some food in straight away. What sort of routine? So did the you routine have? was quite pretty standard. So come in, drink tons of water, get into my tent, change into dry clothes, no shower, no shower, wet wipes. Yeah, okay. Because <laughs> the rivers were too cold for me to get a shower. <laughs> so wet, wi wet wipes and then change into dry clothes, have a meal, just chill out for a while, chat with the people up there, you know. And then there's a, they had an interesting feature where there's a, there's a thing called Dragon's Mail. So where, so uh, you go to the front counter, you scan your barcode, all the mails comes out, whoever your friends were monitoring you, supporting you. So that was the highlight of the night. And then yeah. I'll just wait in the tent for my friend to come back. And then by the time he arrives, I'm already fast asleep. So the morning routine is the same. Get up, uh, pack up your sleeping bag, everything packed into your big, uh, camp bag it's called a camp bag you're given 60 liters so stuff everything in and then put on your gears have your breakfast and then off you go 
Are you allowed phone while you're yeah, racing? Yeah, uh, that's yeah. a mandatory item. It, it is. It okay. is. It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there's obviously quite a, a navigational part yep. of it, right? It's not a marked trail. It's not a marked trail. And all. actually, it's it's both not not marked, but there's just so many different routes you can go yeah. over many of these fells, yeah. right? So, um, yeah, how did you go about sort of planning your routes on the maps for each day? Were you and, and both beforehand and actually were, when you were at the race? So beforehand, they, they provide the map um, on a GPX file and also is able you're able to download it on your phone under View Ranger. So I studied the map quite a bit. Yeah. But on the map, the routes are on the phone. The, the, you don't know which one of the mandatory routes are recommended routes. Because in each day, you're given mandatory routes. That means it's a compulsory route that you must take. Usually it's a main traffic route. Once you're, you're cleared that, then you're given a recommended route. Yeah. So those routes are slightly longer. And then you can actually if you have plotted the map correctly, you can take other short routes. So the first two days, I was pretty safe. I was trying to understand the whole concept of this. Then third day onwards, then I plotted on my map certain deviations. And then I just followed uh, based on my map reading skills and everything on compass. And uh, and I took some shortcuts along the way, by the way. And the, the checkpoints are the summits? You have yeah. to hit them to, yeah. to, to, to make it through. Okay. Yeah, correct. And every one of the checkpoints is always on a summit? Uh, not everyone. There are some on the summit. There are some on the fence line and everything. Like the first day, coming towards the end, I actually missed one checkpoint. So the organizer told me I got two options. One option is to get back and get a click on the checkpoint, or you take a one strike. I say, how many strikes am I allowed? I say, I'm allowed three strikes. I say, fine, I'll take the strike. <laughs> so I didn't want to go back five minutes. Yeah, and it didn't affect times no, or anything. No, it's they don't affect the times. Okay. So it's a very interesting concept. I kind of enjoy the concept yeah. because there's no marking. It's, yeah. You're purely based on navi your navigational skills. So it's like pretty much in the army, you know, you go back to basics, yeah. navigate your way through the terrain. Yeah. yeah. Well, How, we, we, sorry, we can come on to the army background in a minute. But yeah. so, I mean, the, just the experience of being out there, are you are you on your own a lot of the time? Or is it just there's enough people there that you kind of, you've always got other people around yeah. you or in sight? Uh, there are quite a number of people. Okay. Quite a number. Uh, only from third day onwards when the numbers were lesser, the, 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 the crowd was spread out. You are lesser people on but the But I guess you, you don't know if they're going the right way either. Yeah, so you, yeah. you can't, you have to kind of. I mean, a couple of times yourself. people got lost. I, I deviated a bit. There are some kind souls behind me. Mate, wrong word, come back here. And I said, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So then, so it's five days. So then, you, so, uh, you know, at any point did you think you might not finish or it was. Oh, you yeah, were just yeah, we come. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So third day I was running on a, on a good pace. I thought third day would be my, you know, day where I will go below 10 hours kind of pace because I hit the support point, which was about 30 odd K at about seven hours plus so i was quite happy because the remaining i had about 20 odd k and two big mountains to climb yeah. i thought well done so there was a patrol kiosk along the way so that's I a bad that's a bad sign by the way when you start feeling happy with how you're getting yeah. on but yeah so patrol kiosk along the way a lot of them got in buy some bought some food and so i decided to stop in bought myself a coke drank a coke then i realized i couldn't finish the coke so i threw it away went up to the checkpoint started eating my stuff and there was a big hill up there started climbing the hill everything came out Oh, oh no. I started to vomit. I thought, mm, this doesn't look good. So someone along the way saw me. I can't remember the lady's name. She gave me some pills to uh, to curb the vomiting that I, I experienced. Then I said, let me just take about 10, 15 minutes walk and then I'll get back my momentum. And so I walked about 15 minutes and I never got back. And I was miserable. So I walked for about almost about two hours. I sat down there and that moment was my lowest moment. I wanted to quit. I wanted to stop because I knew I had two big hills to climb and I said I won't be able to do this. And is, is that, have you experienced that in other races no, before? This first is the first time. time. It was the first time. Then what happened was I just composed myself and I, a fellow Hong Konger, Alan Lee, he walked past me. I said, okay, he's going at a nice slow pace. Maybe I just follow him, walk slowly. And I just started, I started to walk slowly. I finished the first hill. I said, okay, I'm feeling all right. Then the second hill, I said, okay, I'm feeling pretty good now. And then I realized after the second hill, based on the map, it's pretty gentle down slope. And I started to run. I started to overtake quite a number of people. So that day I finished about 12 hours. So way off my mark, but still happy to finish in one piece. And do you know what it was? What caused the... I suspect it's the coke because my stomach was empty. Yeah. And I think the acidity of the coke would have caused it. Yeah, interesting. I didn't, yeah. I didn't stop there. So I went back to the camp, wanted to eat some food. So I ate some food, everything came out again. So that night I slept on an empty stomach. So the following day I had breakfast, a bit of breakfast, went out to run again, and I started to vomit again. 
So it's just horrible. What were you thinking that night when you went to sleep on an empty stomach? And yeah, I, know, how, yeah. I said, I should be all right because of a day's rest. I should be all right. You know, stomach should be settled. In the morning when I woke up, I said, okay, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. Today should be a good day for me. So let's have, so when I started to eat food, I didn't warm it out immediately. So I, I, th- I thought, okay, should be good. So I just went out of the and then warm it again. Oh. <laughs> it was just horrible. So that day, the only food I was surviving on was a tailwind. And were you able to run or were you... Yeah, yeah I was able to run, but I couldn't okay. meet the 10.30. I did about 10.47 on the day. I was still able to run. My legs were okay. It's just the body, yeah, just uh, can't ingest any food. And at what point were you able to start eating again? Uh, uh, like I that did. evening, you still couldn't? Uh, that evening, so my mate, one of mine, uh, brought instant noodles. Yeah. So I started to eat a bit of instant noodle. And That's I said, like the only, it's like that and chicken soup. Yeah. It's like the only thing you <laughs> can eat when you're feeling, yeah. uh, feeling sick. So like that, that seemed to work well. Yeah. So I ate some instant noodle and then I felt good. The following day, I had a breakfast. Yeah. Wow. And night, that... n- nightmare didn't stop. On the fifth day, I had diarrhea. <laughs> oh, yeah. So it must have been, it definitely wasn't the Coke then. You definitely had some uh, yeah, sort I saw, of bug. I, could have been the, the, the stream waters. You yeah, know, I was going to say, how were you, were you treating water along I, the way? I was in the beginning. Yeah. After that, I got lazy. <laughs> I just drank from the stream. So maybe that's what it was. Sheep poo. <laughs> yeah, that's most. So, funny. so I mean, it sounds like the first two days were technically the harder days. Yeah. But then, 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 personally, you were suffering more through the last three. Yeah. So where and so where did you end up? So you had the five days you aimed for about fifty hours. What was so your? I did fifty-four hours and sixteen minutes, something like that, plus minus. And given three days of vomiting and diarrhea, yeah. that's not bad. Yeah. Because my last day, I mean, based on my fitness, I would have assumed my last day would have been faster, like below nine hours kind of pace. But nah, never mind. Still. Who else did we have out there from Asia? So uh, did, uh, one of my friends, Joshua To, yep. and then uh, Malaysian Eugene Eugene Tan, Eugene Lim, or Eugene Tan, and then Filipino was uh, um, uh, JP, JP yeah. Yeah, and then Hong Konger Alan Lee. Okay, and, uh, and, and then uh, Diamond uh, uh, yeah. uh, Mod O'Shea yeah. as well, yeah, from yeah. Hong Kong. Yeah. yeah, how did they all get on? Uh, they got on, got on well. My friend got on pretty well. Second day, he had a sprained ankle, but he still managed to finish it well. Yeah. Uh, Alan That's Lee, Joshua. yeah, Joshua yeah. To. A fellow runner as well. Yeah. Uh, the others okay, not too bad. They all finished though. Yeah, right? they all finished. Yeah, yeah. Just, just for reference, what was the what was the winning time? Thirty-seven hours plus. Okay. Done by a Canadian, first time ever, and he set the record. Thirty-seven. Yeah. So. And I and a Canadian had he actually trained on the route at yeah, all? Yeah, he, he, he did. He did. Yeah, yeah. I saw him running. Oh, yeah. Impressive, very impressive. What was so impressive about him? They just keep pounding up the hills. There's no relent. They are just relentlessly putting one foot in front of the other, running up the hills. Yeah. And the pace every day is about seven hours plus on the those kind of terrains. It's very impressive, especially the first two days. Running seven hours plus on first two days is yeah bloody impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so, is it a race you'd recommend to people? Yes. Yeah. I recommend because it's it's one that pushes you through the limit both physically and mentally, in terms of the terrain that you're exposed to. Yeah, what would you say was the hardest part of it? Obviously, there's a fair amount of elevation, but what would your advice be to anyone that wanted to go and tackle it? I reckon be mentally prepared for the unexpected weather changes. We were very lucky. The weather was nice and warm, yeah, clear blue sky. beautiful cruise. weather. Yeah, all beautiful week, weather. Because previous years the weather has been nasty. Because yeah. on the day we left uh, Conway to go back to London, the weather was nasty. Yeah. So I think just be prepared mentally. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of, I mean, we can talk a bit more about your training in a yeah. minute. But had you done anything specific for training? Yeah, I did. I changed the way I train. I engaged a coach. Okay. Uh, finally, I decided to have a coach from CTS. Yeah, so I decided to have a coach, so the coach changed the way I train. So she did a lot more. So my, I used to train six days a week. She compressed it to five days a week uh, in line with the five day stage race. And okay. I, let, I did a lot more steady state run. Okay. Uh, so weekdays were one and a half hour recovery, one and a half hour, and weekends were longer runs. And it was time based in, instead of volume based training. I think that benefited me a lot. So, so time-based, but was there any? Were you doing it by heart rate at all? Or no, was just it pace? Based, uh, based on how I feel, perceived feel, yeah. effort. Yeah, yeah. perceived effort. That's and what what perceived effort were you targeting on those one and a half hour daily runs? So, okay, the one and a half hour daily runs were you get about ten minutes warm up, and then a steady state run. Uh, the perceived effort is supposed to be seven, 
and then okay. a five minutes recovery, another steady state run of seven, and then followed by a cool down of an easy effort of four. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, this yeah. where you I mean maybe we jump into a bit of the training now. Yeah. But where where were you training for this? Is this Macritchie. This is on the trails. Yeah, on the trails. Yeah, on the trails. Bukit Timah, climbing up the hills. So all my steady state runs sometimes I do in Macritchie on a flat road, undulating slopes. Or I usually, or if I have time, I go up to Bukit Timah and climb up the slopes, doing the climbing up and down. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so for for, for people who don't know Bukit Timah well, and, and any any endurance athletes in Singapore will, but that's I think 136 meter. 163. 163. 163. 163 is the summit, but yeah. in terms of the elevation gain, yeah. I suppose coming from the it depends what side you come yeah. from. But it's what would you say the elevation gain? It's about 140 plus, I think. Okay. Yeah, I think so. But it's still it's still a lot of loops on there to get anything yeah. like the kind of elevation at Dragon's Back. Yeah. So yeah, the total elevation of Dragon's Back over the five days is 16,000 or so. Uh, yeah, plus minus. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 16,000 plus. Uh, yeah, they say it's like. Double. I don't know why everyone uses double the height of Everest because it's a cut, such an irrelevant stat. Because <laughs> we well, have to you, know the height of Everest. Well, you in the never, first place. We don't climb Everest from sea level, do you? So right. it's uh, kind of irrelevant. But, yeah, um, <laughs> but it, I suppose it's just a way for people to um, to uh, kind of visualise it. I suppose. And then, I mean, just to just to wrap up on Dragon's Back. Yeah. So, how, how have you felt in the week since you came back? Recovery's been good. Yeah, recovery has been good. Uh, I've been sleeping and eating a lot. Uh, yeah, just you, I can imagine you lost a lot of weight. Yeah, right? I did. I did. I lost almost about four kg. Yeah, I lost a lot of my muscle mass. So now I'm just eating, resting. Haven't really ran a lot. Oh, literally haven't run. But yeah, I've been doing a lot of walks with my dog. Hmm. So I just walk long, 20, 30 minutes walk just to get the muscles all going. So I probably will start training next week just to ease into the system. Yeah, yeah, yeah working up to the next one. So, yeah. so Abby, like taking it back then a little bit, how, yeah. did, uh, how did it all come about that you got so into ultra <laughs> running and uh, endurance sports in general? I think it started off in 2012 when I just joined a Gurkha contingent. Uh, before that, I was in the army. So I joined Gurkha contingent. I had a bit of time. You joined what, sorry? The Gurkha. Gurkha contingent police force. Ah, uh, got you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I joined Gurkha contingent police force in 2012. So I had a bit of time. I wanted to do something exciting. I always wanted to do something exciting. And one of my friends said, shall we do an ultra marathon? I said, sure, why not? So we signed up for the first race, TMBT 100K. So that was my first introduction to ultra marathon actually the going back it reminding a bit more the first ever 100k we did was when i was in the commandos we sent up a team to do the hawks fam trail walker yeah. i think that was in early 97 in uh, hong kong hong kong so we did 14 hours plus then nice uh, yeah so i then stopped took a long break put on a lot of weight <laughs> from a skinny old 60 60 over kg boy came became 80 years old 80 kg <laughs> and then decided i had to do something so yeah, so we trained for that and then started doing a bit more ultras from then on. And had you had you always been a runner? Yeah. Like from a, from an early age? Yeah, from early age. From I've always been very sporty since young. Okay. Yeah, I, I just embark on any sports, but running has been the core, 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 so core you were, sport. So you were doing laps in McCritchie for, for cross country when yeah. you were at school? And yeah, I used to represent the school, okay. clubs and everything. What yeah. what discipline did you represent school at? Um, uh, is it track or...? Track, both track and cross country. Yeah. So I used to specialize in 5K, steeplechase, and 10K. So cross country, I used to do 4.8 kilometers. Got you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, so you obviously would have gone into national service at, at seven, 17, 18? Yeah, I got in later. Oh, did you? 21 years old. I had too much fun outside. So, he, so, so I you, oh, you managed to get or? deferrals. <laughs> yeah. I was not traveling, I, w I was a playful boy <laughs> then. I didn't study Elaborate on that. What <laughs> were you doing, Abby? <laughs> what was I doing? Oh, man. I didn't want to study. I was getting involved in gangs, fights, you know, this kind of stuff. Uh, sing typical Singaporean chap does. So I, got it, I was seriously getting involved in all those shit where getting involved in gang fights, drinks. Then I decided I need to stop doing all these things and do something in my life. So I went to pre-university where, you know, pre-university is the path to A-levels then. Yeah. So I went pre-university, I, I was still involved in gang fights and everything, but it was lesser. Then one of my friends introduced me to a running club, a Swift running club. It was very popular then. And then I realized I got a knack for running. And then the running took up so much of my time that all the gang stuff slowly dwindled away. So by, by that, by, at that stage, I was about 20-something years old. So 21, I got enlisted. And uh, there, when I you mean, say you were in gang stuff, did you ever get like in serious trouble? Were you ever locked up? Were no, no, never locked up. Got chased by police though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
police then were different as compared to now. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. At least you had, you had your running background to get <laughs> yeah. away. I yeah. guess. Well, that's when the police wore shorts, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not that long ago. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, so 21, I got enlisted. Since young, I wanted to become a soldier. Yeah. So 21, I got enlisted. Immediately, I, be- I decided to become a regular. I mean, that's a long story. So I became a regular with the Republic Air Force. And then I stayed there for about two years and then decided that was not my cup of tea. And then I had another friend who was, who was from Commando introduced to me this call. You know, Abi, why don't you look at this g- elite group of people who wear black gear and who do storming? Why don't you look at that? I said, sounds interesting. Let's go look at this. And then I looked at their pre-requirement. They said, you need to do, you need to learn, you need to know how to swim. I said, oh crap, I can't swim. <laughs> I, said, I told him, give me a year. Let me go and train, you know, sort out my swimming, my, because I knew my fitness was okay. Let me sort out my swimming. So I went to train out my swimming and then 96, I went for the selection, got selected. And then 97, I enrolled in the Special Forces courses for a year. Wow, okay, yeah. and what, what did that entail? Uh, so we do a lot of uh, green role, which is uh, jungle operations and uh, counter-terrorism operation. Yeah. yeah. And, and how long was it for? A uh, one-year course. Okay, and it mainly in Singapore? Yeah, or mainly in Singapore. Overseas post? Couple of overseas posts? Uh, no overseas posting, but the course is run in Singapore and uh, Thailand and Brunei. Yeah. So the whole one-year course culminates in a four and a half days of a hell week, which is synonymous to Navy SEALs course. Yeah. yeah so we go through that. So that was my toughest time, four and a half days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so does, does that now then, like all the ultras that you're doing, just, just nothing can compare to that hell nah, week? Or is it? Yeah, after I finish this, that's interesting questions. After I finished this call, ra- run Dragon's Back, somebody actually did ask me. I think it's different. It's different. In, um, in the hell week, you are in a team. If you give up, your team suffers. Okay. If you slack off, your team suffers. In an ultra, when you give up, only you suffer. So you yeah. have an option, but the in a hell week, there, yeah. yeah, in a, in a, in, in the hell week, you don't have the, te- you have the temptation, but you don't usually want to give up. And it's hell week, you are constantly put in a, mental and physical evolutions you know you're constantly wet harassed tortured you're carrying load it's just constant harassment it's different yeah, yeah so but it sets your mind to be very strong yeah there must be a lot of pressure at that point on physical fitness and yeah. and the training does that do you think you, that was when you were probably the fittest you've ever been or have you you've, you've carried on your training ever since so it's i think that's the fittest i've ever been yeah yeah just the kind of multi-discipline yeah multi I mean, in terms of strength, anaerobic, uh, aerobic fitness and everything. What sort of training were you doing then? I mean, I was in SOF. Where, yeah, yeah. I what, was... Uh, you, before you were going through Hell Week. <laughs> gonna, so Hell Week is the end, is the yeah, culmination of it, right? You're going to laugh when I say this. So when I graduated from Hell Week, I became a diving platoon commander. <laughs> from a guy who... You haven't swim two years early. Yeah. So I became a diving platoon commander. So within the Special Forces group, diving platoons are known to be the best because you need to be able to dive and at the same time do all the physical activities. Any of this stuff, challenging. Can you imagine diving up here, swimming against current and then hitting a ship and then climbing and then doing storming. Yeah, so those kind of stuff. Yeah, I used to do those kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. okay. And uh, and were you doing much running or training when you were yeah, yeah, doing bit, that? Yeah, quite a bit. But as part of uh, just uh, recreational? Or no, as part, part of the training. Of the training? Yeah, yeah, part yeah. of the training. Yeah. Part and of I'm the sure. overall fitness training. I'm sure you're training with heavy packs yeah. on. And yeah. uh, what part of Singapore were you roaming around? Was it, I suppose, you're, you're not able to say, nah, or is it around the west? Uh, no, uh, east, uh, uh, Changi area, Changi Hendon Camp. Okay. Uh, commandos. Yeah. Yeah. We were housed in the commandos. Still yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> I can say that openly. I think. Yeah. <laughs> and then, how long did you after? How long did you spend in uh, in the forces? For? Uh, I spent about five years there. But because of my rank and everything, I had it. I had to be posted up. Yeah. But then at the same time, I got an opportunity to study overseas, so under a scholarship. So I was, after that, about two year two thousand, uh, I got a scholarship to study in Australia for three years. So that's when I became from a skinny old boy to a, a fat old <laughs> fat man. <laughs> <laughs> my mom couldn't recognize me when she saw me when I came back. <laughs> Whereabouts in Australia? Uh, Brisbane. Okay. Yeah, beautiful place. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I studied. Came back and then back to reality again. I was desk bound. I got desk bound job. I was getting very bored with my desk bound job for a couple of years. And then sometime in 2009, I got the opportunity to cross over to the Gurkha contingent. I took up the opportunity 
and then I'm going to look back. So from 2009 until 2010, I've been working with the Gurkha contingent under Singapore Police Force. And how does it, yeah, what does what your current role entail? So currently I'm a wing commander. Wing commander is like a battalion commander. So I got a man, uh, I got a group of men who are about 400 in size. So I manage them, command them and lead them. That's my current job scope. Wow. Yeah. And they are all fully enlisted yeah. or rather than, um, yeah, they're, they're not, because obviously in, uh, we still have national service in Singapore, so they're not people that come in for just no, uh, no, two no, weeks no. every year. No, four, no. Or 400 fully yeah. enlisted. Wow. Yeah, fully enlisted. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, are, you, are you teaching fitness? Or sorry, not teaching. Are you kind of putting them through physical no, training? Or? No, 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 I don't. Okay. I don't. I'm more on the leadership role. Okay. So the fitness part is done by some other guys. Yeah. 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 You still get involved? Yeah, sometimes what? I do get involved. Sometimes. I, but I always try to take a step back and let the guys on the ground run the training. Yeah. And what what is what do all of your team think about you and all your exploits? I think running? they are quite inspired by me whenever they hear about my adventures. Some of them are keen to take part. So I know some of them went back. So every year they get to go back to Nepal for their leave. So some of them do take part in some of the. So they're all Nepalese. I know yeah. it's the Gurkhas, but they're not Singaporean. No, no. Ah, oh, interesting. So we okay. have a group of Singaporeans to manage and look after them. Yeah. But bulk of it is all Nepalese. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, so like I was saying, so some of them go back to Nepal, take part in uh, ultra marathons. Yeah, I've seen. I had a friend who was who was uh, I don't know what his rank was, but it was a, a, a British guy who was yeah. working with the Gurkhas here. Ah. And uh, we'd go running together at Macritchie, and you'd quite often see the Gurkhas there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doing doing laps on their days off, and yeah. Yeah, it's uh, really close by. Our Paul yeah. just down the road. Yeah, yeah. Interesting, yeah, interesting lifestyle there because he was living on the base. Yeah, yeah um, correct. Yeah. So currently, I'm living on the base. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. I mean, the, the, one of the perks of the job is I get to go to Nepal every year. Right. So I spend about a month up in Nepal doing recruitment. So as part of the job, I love, I love to run, so I explore all the trails up there. Amazing. So you can get some good altitude training. And, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So this August, I'm heading up there, so I'm planning a, like a 10-day fast pack with my friends. That's very And cool. do you do the recruiting out there as yeah, well? Do you I head do. out to Nepal to do recruiting? Yeah, I do. And I what? Yeah. Much yeah. <laughs> and what what are you looking for? Because I think I've seen a video or something. You actually put them through pretty um, rigorous training. They have to do loads of pull-ups. No, those are, of those are, I mean, if you look at the British Army, we follow the same standard as the British Army because yeah. we work together with, with the British Army to select the Nepalese. So, yeah. Nah. Oh, okay, yeah, fair <laughs> enough. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, I'm not going to go into too much of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's great podcast material. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, so 2012 was your first, and what, what persuaded you to do the TMBT um, 100? What was it that, why, why was it that one that captured you? Because I mean, there's been quite a few ultras in Singapore, just some of the like 50k ones. Yeah, I, I never liked the idea of racing in Singapore. Yeah, because you've done all the trails. Yeah, back I've done back all the and, trails, yeah. and then you know, getting back on the same trail, you see the same things, and I always find the Singapore trails are very crowded. So I thought. Well, uh, based on time, at that time, not many ultras were around within Asia. We realized, okay, let's do TMBT. Sounds interesting. Looks like we can get a glimpse of uh, uh, Kinabalu. Um, and a couple of Singaporean friends were heading up there as well. So I said, okay, let's do this. And that's one of the, that's, that's the most beautiful thing, ultra, that's in, uh, near Kinabalu in September. That's one of the longest standing ultras in Asia, isn't it? Yeah, it's been yeah, around it a is. while. It is. Yeah. Yeah, we're actually, uh, we're uh, both doing it in September, actually. We're going to be covering it on the podcast yeah, as well. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, we, we ran it last year. Uh, I think Mount Kinabalu is just such an iconic, I mean, we've got it as our logo, but it's such an iconic mountain. Mm. And it's very, uh, especially in Southeast Asia, it's one of the highest in yeah. Southeast Asia. Uh, but it's a beautiful trail race that just around the foothills, you just got the view of Mount Kinabalu the, pretty much the whole way, right? Yeah, it is, it is. Yeah, so that was my first one. I mean, uh, Aman, the uh, organizer, Aman Sindhu is a brilliant guy. He used to be a runner, yeah. but then he's down with heel, heel, yeah, heel he's health not, and everything. Yeah, he's pretty sick, isn't he's it? Like sick. Klaus has taken over yeah, quite yeah, a bit yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, how did you get on with it in that first year? Oh, I, I did 18 hours. Okay, yeah, solid. Not yeah. too bad. <laughs> not too bad. But I suffered though, because I mean, I haven't run... My first venture was uh, 100k. I didn't do marathons or 50k. I just jumped straight into... 100k so I wore shoes to uh, normally wear for road running size not a what you know usually wear for ultra marathon half a size bigger yeah. one size bigger so I suffered wearing a Salomon shoe 
and you lost your nails, did yeah, you? Yeah, I did. Lose I them. did exactly the same thing in yeah. a pair of Salomon. They, they just because they're quite closed at the yeah. front, aren't they? And they yeah. just, uh, yeah, they just shred your toes. Yeah, but somehow or other, after that, I got addicted to ultra marathon. So from then on, I never looked back. You must have finished pretty high up in the field with 18 hours. Yeah, I, I can't remember. I just yeah. can't recall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then, from there, what did you go on and do after that? Uh, Lantau 100. I did Lantau 100 again. I did about the eight. Trans Lantau. Ah, uh, Trans Lantau. Yeah. Uh, I did eight. 18 hours, I think. Yeah. Yeah, 18 hours plus. Then after that year, I did uh, TDS. TDS was a fluke, actually. Which one's TDS? TDS, the uh, part of UTMB. Okay. Yeah. And that's like, what is that? Uh, 120 One, or something? 120, yeah. Yeah. Okay. With about so 7,000 plus. Okay, so you got triple C is the hundred, yeah. and then TDS, and, and then, then UTMB. UTMB got they say yeah. I, I, TDS doesn't get as much publicity as the others, but they say it's sort of wilder trails are like yeah. slightly more remote and more tougher. Tougher is it? Okay. Yeah, apparently, I say this because when I signed up for TDS, I didn't realize it was 120 and um, at the kind of elevation yeah. gain. I said I didn't want to do the 100 because I've already done 100. I didn't qualify for the 100 miler. So I said I had no other options. Let's do TDS. <laughs> so when I went to Europe, some of my friends said, hey, do you know that what you sign up for is rated tougher than UTMB? I said, oh, thank you <laughs> very much for telling me now. <laughs> but I was, yeah, it is tougher. The climbs are very steep. Climbs are very and how did you? How did you? What you so said? What year was that? That was the 2013 or 14 or something. No, 2014, I think. Okay. 2014. And how did you get on? Ah, I did 24 hours, I think. 24, 23 hours, I think so. Thereabouts. And did you did you feel as you were doing each of these races, you were getting stronger, smarter about what you were doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was really becoming smarter. I didn't pick choose. I did not pick races stupidly anymore. I I started to pick races smarter, or smartly. Yeah. So I suppose then, because you had the points from TMBT and yeah. from Translantel, and then you're like, oh, hold on oh. a second, I've got UTMB points. Was that what motivated yeah. you to Correct. then go and do it? Yeah, and then I did a STY as well. Then they had STY in oh, Japan. That's the, the UTMF a UTMF sister race, isn't it? Yeah, UTMF sister race. I think now they've got no more U STY. Yeah, that was a nice race. It was cold, though, very cool. Extremely cool. And so that was twenty, yeah, twenty twelve into twenty thirteen. Yeah. What, uh, what, uh, what did you have go? Yeah, what was next? What was next on the twenty thirteen was STY, I think. STY. Yeah. Then I can't remember. Can't remember what else I did twenty thirteen. Yeah. Yeah. And then th this idea that you said of looking for races that I, you know, th where there's something new about them, like y you hadn't done them before, obviously, but perhaps no Singaporean had done them before. Is it, is that something that kind of came? Later on. Later on, you started yeah. to looking for, for new I think challenges. It came on because I was feeling, I was getting a bit more experience, getting a bit more confident in the way I could handle myself out in the ultras, and getting stronger as well. And then I realized I, I, I developed a knack for climbing and descending. So I said, maybe I should go a different way, find races but that were slightly different and harder. Where, where did that come from, do you think? And was, it, was that linked to the training you were doing or? I don't know, maybe from the way I, I was brought up, because yeah. I wasn't brought up in an urban city area. I was brought up in a kampong, okay. in a Jalang Ulu Sambawang. So I, I just run barefoot along the on the grass patch and everything. I, I was not fearful of falling down, getting cuts and everything. I guess that I developed that, that from yeah. the way young. Mm. Yeah. So moving in, uh, yeah, moving into sort of 2014, 2015, okay. I forget what, what was the, yeah, what was your sort of plan in terms of uh, choosing races after after that point? So, yeah, so I, 20, 2014, 2015, I did H1. Yeah. Again, same same philosophy. Again, That's, H1 is hardcore 100, hardcore 100 in, uh, in Philippines, Philippines, 100 miler, right? 100 miler. So that was my first 100 miler. Again, the selection criteria was same because I knew previous years none of the Singaporeans had completed. So I wanted to fire the Singaporean flag again. And I wanted to choose a miler with about 10,000 plus elevation gain. Within, that would have been your first miler yeah, as well, right? Yeah. So within Asia, that's the only one that had a miler with a 10,000 meter plus elevation gain. So I said, okay, let's do that. So I trained pretty hard for that and then went and completed it. I think came in 12 or 11 for that. Well, that and that is a, I mean, obviously oh, it was, was two weekends ago, yeah. wasn't it? And it was a tough race, yeah. right? What? How did you find it? Tough, because the cutoffs are very tough. It's 40 hours. Yeah. 40 hours for a 100 miler with 10,000 plus elevation. It's tough. Yeah. You're just constantly on the move, on the move. No time for you to take a break. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. tough. And the, the, I remember the first, that year when we did, the marking, markings were very bad. So I got lost pretty badly because some of the villagers shifted the markings and everything. There was no GPX file. Uh, but still managed to survive that. 
Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and uh, that year, was it? Was there a lot of people signed up for it? It yeah. must have been, yeah, there was. Yeah, no, there was really a lot. Uh, that year, a lot of people signed up for it. I think that year, Jerry, Alex Ko, hey, Alex Ang, and a few more other Singaporeans completed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was a yeah, wonderful yeah, yeah. year. Yeah. Yeah. It was amazing seeing uh, how many amazing runners yeah. DNF that race. Yeah. It's got a very high rate. Isn't high it? rate Not yeah. just the cutoffs, but just, the, I think it's the amount of elevation <laughs> as yeah, well. Yeah, I suspect... Be- because the climbs are long, yeah. long and continuous, and some parts of it are very steep. And if you stop to take a break, it just takes up of your time. You just got to constantly move, 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 move. Yeah. 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 So I think a lot of people make the mistake of stopping during a climb, you know, trying to catch their breath. Either that, or they don't have not trained sufficiently for the race. Yeah. 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 Or underestimate the race. And, and that's actually it. How do you, living in Singapore, which is pretty much flat as a pancake, yeah. obviously we talked about Bukatima where you can get in 100 and odd metres of vert every every summit, but you've just been stomping the trails around Bukatima to, to train for all of, these, uh, all of these ultras over the years. Yeah. I think my philosophy of training has been always consistent. Uh, I believe in strength training. I do a lot of a CrossFit that involves um, explosive movement, big movement like squats, deadlift, those kind of big movement. I supplement, uh, the CrossFit supplements my running. And um, over the years, I've, I've changed my running. When I initially started off my running, I do a lot of hard runs. Every run was a hard run. Every run I push, 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 push. And then as I grew older, I said, I can't sustain this because I got a lot of injury. I tore my calf muscle, tore my Achilles. I remember one year I did the uh, Ultra Trail Australia. Just four weeks before the race, I tore my calf muscle. So I, I, I went to do some injections to get it recovered. It recovered in time, but I DNF the race because <laughs> I had an ITB injury. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So over the years, I've, I've modified my turn training to take it slow and steady when it's time to push hard I push when it's time to hold hold back I just hold back and take it easy yeah, yeah. And, so, and so what, what does a what does a typical week look like now so obviously you said you modified it a little bit for for dragon's back yeah you're doing five days rather than six but how are you mixing in the how many times a week are you doing crossfit how many runs are you going for so when, when I was training for dragon's back I, I cut away my crossfit because I realized I couldn't complement, both cannot complement each other. It, it takes a toll when you're doing CrossFit. I'm quite competitive with crop, CrossFit as well. So I said, I cut away CrossFit, I just focus on my running. So during a typical week for the training was uh, one heart, one recovery, heart, and then uh, Friday is a rest day. Saturday, Sundays are my long, long run days. And usually Saturday, Sundays, are, it involves a lot of climbing as well. And yeah. what's, what's long for you then, training for a race like that? Uh, so the longest run I did was six hours followed by a four hour run and then the following week was four four and then during the taper week was two 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 hours yeah, yeah. that was my longest and it's measure, measuring time on feet not distance yeah or, not distance yeah. Uh, time on feet it seems to work well mm-hmm. seems to work well because I was uh, I just ignored the distance just based it fully on uh, on time seems yeah. to work very well do, do you monitor your heart rate no. whilst you don't at all I don't I, I, was, I tried to monitor it before but I just gave up I just gave up. It didn't work for me. So yeah. now I just go based on perceived effort. It seems to work very well for me right now. Perceived yeah. based on perceived effort. How did you first set out your perceived effort though? Because obviously, as you, yeah, it's it's because there's a few different ways you can do. It. You can do it in terms of your your hard and uh, and easy runs. So you can do it by heart rate, or you can do it by your pacing, yep. or you can do it by perceived effort. Yep. Um, but how do you know? You met, you mentioned a scaling of zero to ten. Yep. So how do you know when you're seven or when you're four? Okay, so if you, uh, there's a book by Jason Coop, How to Train for Ultra Marathon. So in the book, he explains. Four is where you have, you can, you and I can talk story, you know, just conversation like that. Yeah. This con- that just goes you, on and on and on. Five is a conversation pace, you know. Uh, every maybe, every 10, 15 sentences, I got to catch my breath. Yeah. So six, seven is maybe two to three sentences only. That means your heart rate is probably about 160, 165. After that is beyond that is you can't converse anymore. So yeah. that's the so how I do it while I'm running. If I'm going on a steady a steady state seven, I'll speak out loud. Yeah. If I can say two to three sentences, that means I'm on the right, correct, yeah, <laughs> correct pace. 160, 170, maybe my heart rate is. Interesting. Yeah. And do you? I, I've seen you out on the trails quite a bit, running in groups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So do you? How much of your training do you running with uh, with other people, and how much do you do uh, going solo out there? So this group is a. Uh, it's all. 
former ex-commandos yeah. all had midlife crisis like me <laughs> uh, uh, two years ago we formed this group fitness family so they all decided to come and join me for a run so usually when I'm training for a race I'll start earlier like 4am or 5am and then I'll link up with the group and then we'll just carry on with them and then they'll finish up they'll have a breakfast I'll carry on after that so that's how I do so usually weekends I'll plan a program for them to train and over the years the group has become bigger and they've been participating in a lot more races and they're getting stronger I'm very happy yeah how many people so the, the fitness family talk to us uh, oh, man, uh, we have almost about 40 over people ah oh, really yeah, all ex-commandos uh, maybe 5 or 6 are non-commandos 40 40 40 ish 40 ish in yeah. their mid 40s 40s to 50 so yeah just They've been doing quite a number of races, surprisingly. I'm surprised. They just, a couple of them just signed up for um, Kowloon Kong last night. Oh, the big, the, the Chinese yeah. UTMB. Yeah, Chinese UTMB next year. So they're going up to Kowloon Kong. I'm trying to convince a few of them to go to do North Burn 100 miler with me next year. So let's see. A uh, what 100 miler? A uh, North Burn 100 mile. North New Zealand. Ah, oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Is that in the South Island, is it? Uh, yeah, South Island. Christchurch is South Island, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 How did it all come together then? How did you... Uh... So I, we used to have a small group, you know, just a small group of guys. We used to train together. Yeah. And then this small group, they had another group that used to train separately. So somehow from this small group, his name is Norris, knew the other guys from the other group and decided to bring everybody together. So one weekend we just gathered. They asked me to conduct a training. So we did a tra I remember the first training we did was in Mount Faber. Everybody died. I thought that's it. This group is going to be disbanded <laughs> after the first training session because the you next killed day killed them in the first session. Yeah, and they yeah. were complaining they can't walk, they can't do anything. <laughs> so I have a circuit in Mount Faber where you run up the stairs, come down, do burpees and squats, and then climb again. So just to build their whole engine and uh, legs and everything. But I killed them. But some the following weekend, I said let's do something more, a bit more easy. But then when the following weekend came, the group became bigger, and then it just built up from there. I think. And, and I must say they, they are very motivated, very motivated. Yeah. Uh, every day they are training, finding different ways of to train and understand themselves. Yeah, and yeah. they've supported you on quite a few of your races, yeah, yeah. right? So quite a few of the crew have come out for Hong Kong four trails yeah. both years. Twice. Right? <laughs> both years, yeah. yeah. And so, so moving on to that, because uh, I think that was the... Do you know what, actually? I, I think I, I actually met... I remember where I met you first now. I met you on a flight over to Lombok, to, uh, racing Rinjani. Rinjani. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And that would have been... That would have been 2018. Yeah, May, 20, May last yeah, year. Yeah, correct. And, uh, and yeah, bumped into your plane, said hello, and then obviously, because oh, yeah, obviously yeah, yeah. I'd seen you yeah. do the four trails then, and we were both doing the 60... Uh, 65, 60, right, or 60. Oh, 60K that yeah, year, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but that first year, 2018, that you, uh, that you did, for, when did you first decide to, to give it a crack? Uh, the first year when I knew about Hong Kong four trails was uh, when Jerry did it, I think 2016. Yeah. I saw a Facebook post. She was packing some white stuff, and then I asked her, what are you, tra what are you doing? Packing uh, I, some white stuff. I said, yeah. what is this white stuff? She said, oh, this is Tailwind, a new nutrition. I said, oh, interesting. But what are you packing for? She said, Hong Kong Four Trails. She said, what is Hong Kong Four Trails? I said, why didn't you go find out? So I went to Google and I said, whoa, this is interesting. All oh, the Four Trails self-supported. I said, okay, maybe one day. <laughs> one day I'll do it. And then 2017, actually, I wanted to do it. But the year before, I did the... What race did I do? Ah, I did a Great Southern Endurance Run in Melbourne. So I injured my ankle. So I dropped the email to Andre saying I had to pull out of the race for 2017 because I injured my ankle. They'd say fine. And at this point, what's the longest you'd run? So you'd done 100 milers, but had you, run, had you done any further than that? Or is that? Yeah, the Great Southern Endurance Run was uh, 180k. Okay. Yeah, uh, that was a tough one as well, along the Alpine Trail. That was tough. You guys should do it. Yeah, uh, that's uh, actually the, the one um, that... Starts uh, from a Buller, Mount Buller to Bright. Yeah, and this year the the it's lady that org uh, Candice Burt won the female one this year. I think the lady that organises the triple crown oh. in the, uh, races in the, U in the US. I think she raced it this year. But um, yeah, it sounds like a tough one. But yeah. Um, so yeah, 2017 you you had actually signed up for uh, four <laughs> trials. Not many people know about this. Yeah. And then 2018, I said I told my wife I'm going to do this. She said okay, she'll support me. So 2018, I signed up. I I didn't know what to expect. So I went up there, rocked up, and then just did the trails, and then suffered quite a bit. Didn't recce the route, got lost tremendously. I know, and so you'd, you'd run in Hong Kong before because you'd done Lam Tau, but yeah. so you didn't, you didn't recce the route, you, you didn't know, really know what you were getting into. Yeah, I, I recce the route, but 
didn't do a thorough recce. Okay. Didn't do a thorough recce like what I did for last year or this year. So I did some some parts of the route recce, downloaded GPX and everything, but still got lost badly. Uh, spent a lot of time trying to find my way back on the trails. <laughs> yeah, that was hilarious. <laughs> I say hilarious because I like I like I enjoy being on the trails. Yeah. yeah getting lost, I'm assuming is I assume is part and parcel of of trail running anyway. So that taught me a that taught me a good lesson. Uh, to be a bit more serious on Hong Kong four trails, so. What was your What was your time that first year? Seventy. Seventy four. Seventy four hours. Yeah, I remember you came in because that year, and just as a reminder to people that don't know, the four trails is the four long trails of Hong Kong, fully self supported, two hundred ninety eight kilometers, <laughs> and fourteen and a half thousand meters elevation, non stop, yeah. no sleep. Mm-hmm. Uh, like when you when you repeat it all again, it's like why would you even think about it? Um, but that that first year that you did it, uh, I remember you uh, you because uh, that year they were doing like Facebook Live when people came into yeah. the finish line, and you came in with Will Haywood. Yeah, 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 Will yeah. Haywood. <laughs> yeah, when he had his like weird like, yeah. and, and that had only started like I think a couple of kilometers before the end. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Um, that was interesting because I was coming down the Lantau slope, and then I saw this guy. Say, who's this tall, lanky guy with the neck at one side? What's happening to him? So I thought, let's go and see what's happening to him. So I went up to him. I asked him, are you all right? He said, I'm fine. But he seems to be running towards the drain. So I said, <laughs> let me run next to you just in case. You know, we're going to finish this. Let's, let me just guide you and then let's finish this together, man. And then I just ran together with him to finish it. Oh, mate, that's very cool. <laughs> yeah, it was great seeing you both get over, yeah. yeah, get to the green post box at the same time. Yeah, yeah. so from there, I, I, I've learned quite a lot about myself. I mean, I realized, I realized self-supported is a different ball game. I had, a bit, I had to be a bit more serious on training and training on a fasted state and everything. So come to 2018, last year, I changed the way I trained and I did more specific training, like a lot more climbing, a lot more dialing in my nutritional stuff and I spent about five days with Elvin Peng in Hong Kong to recce the routes again to ensure that I don't get lost. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's really interesting because I think when <coughs> you did obviously survive it, there was a 75 hour cut off that year. Was it 75 hours? Yeah, yeah 75. Um, and yeah, so I think with any race where you don't finish it or out DNF or even any race that you finish, just yeah. learning about what you can do differently or how you can improve for the next attempt or even just your next race. So from that first, uh, uh, the first uh, attempt and the four trails, what you mentioned wrecking the route, doing more hill training, nutrition. And it- also a lot more running as well, running on roads. Because yeah. I realised Hong Kong... And the catch water and yeah, things like that. I realised the first one... I didn't have the running legs. I had the climbing legs, but no running legs. So I did a lot more road running uh, in Singapore. Way more than I that I want to, but it was a necessity for me to complete the four trails. So a lot more running. So I could run a lot more when the when I started the Hong Kong four trails. Yeah. yeah. That was the, that was the I mean, in my mind, that's the key difference that, that made me yeah, almost closer to my target. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting because uh, after me attempting it last year, yeah. I only pretty much did road running because just time frame, I had to use the commute as my training and I actually think that I didn't do enough hills. Mm. And I remember seeing your training, you were uh, still up at Bukatima and Faber constantly getting yeah. in the elevation. Yeah, um, yeah but plus, plus, I mean, Hong Kong four trails, you're not allowed to use poles. Yeah, yeah so that, uh, that adds a lot of pressure. A lot of stress on your legs and everything. I had to condition that as well. So my climbing and my running, I think, yeah, that helped quite a bit. So you would have used you used poles in the first year. Um, yeah, I used poles on the first year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah I yeah, used yeah. poles on the first year. But after that, yeah, because he then Andre decided poles makes people too easy, and then no more poles. Yeah, but so I think the key difference I made was my nutrition and uh, a lot more road running that helped me get closer to my target. Yeah. And the nutrition change was to just simplify it yep. to tailwind and, and yum, n- and y- yum, yum butter. butter. Yeah. yeah. I just simplified the whole process. And uh, yeah, just simplified the whole process. So even when you got to the end of each trail in between them and you you have your support team, yeah, it, so you I were had, still stayed in the same nutrition? No, no, food? I had some uh, additional food, but no cooked food. Uh, yep. More hot food, like for example, oats, chocolate, a lot more water. That's about it. Yeah. yeah I realized I can sustain for longer duration with very little food and still perform at a considerable performance yeah yeah you mentioned about 
fasted so you were doing most of your yeah. morning runs without eating yeah, or correct. most of my morning runs were without food yeah. yeah like the six hours run I six hours run that I was training for for Dragon's Back I, I had nothing just tailwind that's about it sometimes I even just train with water only no, not even tailwind yeah, just to yeah. see how my body reacts and everything yeah, yeah. What's, uh, before we get into the most recent four trials, what do you do around nutrition just on a daily basis? Like what, what, sort, of, uh, yeah, what so, sort of food do you okay, eat? What's so your diet? On a daily basis, I'm pretty clean. I, I don't indulge in much uh, fried food. So I prepare my meals. Breakfast, lunch and dinner is at home. Yeah. So breakfast is usually eggs and bacon with some avocado. Lunch is salad with salmon. And then dinner is usually chicken and salad. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much it. So pretty much like a... A uh, uh, high, high fat, low yeah, carb diet. Yeah, pretty much. Say? Yeah. Do you do you like count your macros? No, I don't. Or? I don't. I tried, but I failed miserably. It yeah. was too time consuming. So I went on my feel. I said, okay, today I'm feeling pretty good, full. I'm feeling good, and en- in terms of energy, I'm feeling good sense of energy. So I just keep within that that that, that portion sizes. Yeah. yeah. Have then, you ever have you ever done fuel efficiency tests no. to see what your fat no. burning is like? No, never. never. Yeah. So I supplement it with a couple of vitamins as well. I take uh, like uh, protein shakes, uh, whey protein isolate, uh, plus uh, magnesium pills. And what else? Multivites. That's and it. is that is that based on an, on testing you've done to no. know that you're just just, <laughs> just to feel again? Just to feel again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it seems to work. So yeah, it seems to work. I don't yeah. like to break something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and with that, I suppose you haven't uh, you. You haven't had many injuries since you've changed your training yep. to go slower. Yep. And, and, and has your diet changed massively? I know yeah. you were 80 kilos, so it must yeah, have changed yeah, a bit it has, since it has. It has changed tremendously. I mean, I used to eat anything and everything out there because my excuse was I'm training so hard, I can eat anything yeah. and everything. Then yeah. I realized I felt so, you know, I couldn't recover on time. I felt so lethargic. Like this week, you know, I'm just eating everything and anything. I feel so lethargic, I feel so heavy. Now I'm back to my normal diet. Yeah. I feel good. You know, my stomach is not so bloated. It feels good. And then yeah. I'm able to recover faster as well, sleep better. So massive difference. Yeah. Maybe eating all the fried stuff and everything. Oh, yeah. massive difference. Yeah, I'm yeah. with you as well. I've um I've been you on, are a on a high fat diet, aren't you? Yeah, I've been on a high fat diet for uh, over two years now. Yeah. And I the same. So I was in I was in San Francisco for work a couple of weeks ago and yeah. I had uh, it was my birthday, so I had a night I was just like, right, I wanna go crazy and I was eating I we had like uh, cookies in the office and I had like birthday cake and then went out for dinner and had pasta and had like a uh, tiramisu and I had just ate loads of and that night I woke up in the middle of the night and then I was just like or oh, something's not right and yeah. then I just spent the next five hours throwing up yeah. and actually like I don't think I had a bug it was just my body going what the <laughs> hell have you just done yeah. to me this is not and it's so bad and I came to realize actually that I, I, when I eat bad food and I feel like really not feel great that's generally how I always felt before but it was just <laughs> that was what the mark was and I think that's what most people when they eat really bad food it's like well this is just where it is and it's the not until you, you change your diet and eat really clean that you realize ah oh, okay I, I could feel so much better if I just uh, cut out all the bad processed carbs and, and fry food yeah but I'm, 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 I think I'm very lucky as well because my wife Caroline she supports me she prepares yeah. all the meals for me yeah, yeah. Um, from lunch and dinner. So breakfast, I do it myself. So she's, she also follows a similar diet, slightly different, but she still follows the same diet. The only indulgence I have is chocolate. Anything chocolate, I just drool. I say, ah, chocolate, chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> dark chocolate, dark chocolate. 85% dark chocolate is the way to go. <laughs> yeah. um, and so, uh, and then you, so you came back for the Hong Kong Four Trials the second year and you put in an absolutely amazing yeah, show. Yeah, I did, right? I did. But I guess not enough. <laughs> yeah. Not enough. I, I'm, I'm, disappointed of course so the 60 hour is the breaking 60 is yeah. the mark and, and this mark. year you got in a uh, 63 64. yeah 64 i got a penalty because i, I missed a turn at a hong kong trail i think uh, uh, andre actually messaged me and then he asked me hey abby do you know you made a wrong turn i said do i did i then he showed me the gpx file so oh yeah so he gave me a penalty of one hour which is fair which is yeah fair. yeah which is fair um yeah so yeah, disappointed. I think my wife is disappointed as well. <laughs> uh, second year, Chinese New Year is burned. So she's disappointed. And, my and because she knows you're going to have to go back and do it again. Yeah. Yeah. So she's disappointed. I'm disappointed. But I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm disappointed as well. <laughs> Let's keep it there. I mean, do you, do you feel like there was as much you can learn from that one? This, I mean, you were so, yeah, much, yeah. You were so much closer this time, you kind of, 
could have just been could have been a different day and you could have got there i guess yeah i think that that's still some learning to do i think i was uh, fuffing around at the check at my support crew points there were some points where i my support crew asked me to fuck off but i decided i need to rest longer i think i should have just listened to them and mm. moved my butt out because yeah. i said let me rest a bit longer they said no you got to move now i said a bit more a bit more <laughs> i think that a bit more took up just you know eight in if you accumulate the time you just eight into everything else so sometimes i just got to trust my support crew especially my wife <laughs> so will you be back next year i don't know yet <laughs> i'm not going to answer that question <laughs> yeah. yet yeah it's a big commitment yeah it is it? a big commitment next year is uh end january as well yeah yeah chinese new year is way earlier and it's a big commitment yeah. yeah, and do you think? I mean, this ties into the training we were talking about. Do you think being in Singapore is a disadvantage for training for this sort of thing, or do you, or do you feel like actually that you're making excuses if you say that? And I mean, if you think it's a disadvantage, it's a disadvantage. But I think, like you said, it's an excuse for most people. I mean, there's many ways to skin a cat, and if you find ingenious way of training. Mm-hmm. I think being in Singapore gives you the added advantage because it gives you the motivation and drive to achieve a lot of stuff that other people are mm-hmm. achieving. Of course, we say if you are comparing yourself with people living in Europe, you can you can never be as good as them, but you can compete at least to go up there and to DNF saying that you know because I live in Singapore is a rather lame excuse for me because mm-hmm. I speak to a lot of ultra runners who come and talk to me, you know, and say hey. I know I, I DNF this, I DNF this. I, I did not expect this race to be so tough. And then I, the first question I ask them is, why did you sign up for ultra? And they say, mm, because I want to complete. But you, did you think it's going to be easy? No. So you knew it's going to be tough, right? And then you come and tell me it is tough. What the? F- <laughs> then don't sign up for the race. I mean, that's how I feel. Yeah. So that's how I always tell my friends as well. You sign up because you know ultra marathon is going to be tough. It's going to push you to your limits. No matter how fast, how slow you're going to go. If you're going slow, it's even worse because you're going to be out there through the 24 hours, 48 hours. It's going to be painful for you, right? So you need to condition your body and your mind. So train hard in Singapore. This is the resources that we have. If you need to go up Bukit Timah 100 times, 20 times, do it. Because that will get you through the finishing line. And then, you know, nutrition is very important. Sort out your nutrition in Singapore, not race day. And then, oh, I need this gel, that gel. But training, I did not use all this stuff. And then you come and tell me, oh, I had the issue. And then uh, I ask you questions again. Oh, because I tried a new gel. That's, there you go. So, yeah, so I think people do use that as an excuse. I mean, that's my own personal opinion. I mean, because I guess you could argue that, you know, it's, hard to tra- it's harder to train for the, the elevation. But on the other hand, People coming over from Europe to do four trails, they're not used to the heat, the yeah. humidity. You get that training pretty well here. Yeah. Yeah, James Paul, who's a like, top ultra runner from the UK, he really struggled. With oh, the yeah, heat. yeah. I don't know yeah. if you remember I on remember the four him. trails yeah, that yeah, yeah. I went past him at the, uh, in stage three, and he, was at the, he just got to the top and he was just sitting there throwing up. And I was like, oh dear, that's not a good place to be at this stage yeah. of the. Having said that, you pulled through that the, at the dragon's back. But when you know it's through suffering from the heat and not being able to hold down water, if you're already di- dehydrated and throwing up, you're in for a, uh, well, I was going to say a long night. Pretty sure it's uh, easy to do. Yeah, I know how it then. feels now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But still, as I say, that wasn't, you weren't, the heat, it was obviously warm in in, uh, in Wales, but it wasn't... Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't as compared so to Hong Kong, it's nowhere near. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so you didn't, you know, you, f- you finished Dragon's Back, which is amazing, despite the challenges. You said you, you've DNF'd, you DNF'd UT Australia. Uh, yeah. And is that the only, is that the only DNF? Or no, North Burn. North Burn, okay. 100 miles. And so, so talk us through a few of those, or what's... Uh, okay, so the first DNF was uh, Ultra Trail Australia. So I didn't have the 50k mark. So I had a somehow or other I had an ITB pain. I don't know why I got that, but up at the 50k mark I just couldn't run at all. So it was my, I handled the DNF very badly because it was my first ever DNF. I handled it so badly that I was supposed to come back two days later after the race. I called my wife. I said, "Can you book a flight for me next day? I want to come back." So she booked the flight. I came back because I didn't know how to handle a DNF. I was so bad. Just the, the disappointment. Yeah, of the, the okay. whole disappointment of it, and I came back was miserable for a month. I just didn't want to see anyone. I said, "Don't disturb me." <laughs> I was utterly disappointed. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I was miserable. And so, what did you do to to overcome that misery? I just got up to run again. 
and then got out to run again, met up with my friends again, started running again, and then it slowly, slowly I got over it, and then, yeah, just got better from there. But were you, were you, were you disappointed that you'd, you didn't finish, or were you disappointed because you think you, you could, you, you know, it sounds like you didn't really have a choice, but do you, were, you, were you disappointed because actually you think, I could have pushed on a bit more or not? I was disappointed I could not finish. And I was disappointed because when I finished the first 50k, I was about six and a half hours. Okay, if I knew, if I didn't have the ITB, of course, I could have done in a good timing. But then, yeah, so the ITB, and I knew I couldn't continue because the medic checked my leg. So I changed my shoe, put straps and everything. So started to run again. I just couldn't put my right leg down. Just every step was a pain. Yeah, that's so. interesting. And so then the the second DNF you had oh. was the one in New Zealand? Yeah, second DNF is something that I asked for myself. I say that because before the DNF, I had a bit of Achilles problem, left Achilles issues. So I went, I already signed up for the race. Everything has been paid for. I said, I'll just try to wink it, you know, just go and do the 100 mile and let's see how it goes. So the, it's a three loop course. It's a three loop course. You come back to the same uh, main start point yeah. after each loop. So the first 50k, I did about seven hours. Is this work. self-navigation? No, no, it's not. It's a no, market. there is one in South New Zealand that is a, like a real a navigation loop. It's a bit, it's kind of like the Bar, uh, Barclay okay. sort, oh, of, uh, okay. sort of loop. But yeah, I forget the name of it. But um, but sorry, so you went, um, yeah, sorry. So back okay, to your story. Okay, so it's a three loop course, three different loops. So each loop will bring you back to the start point. Right, so the first loop, I did about seven hours plus, which is about 70k. So second loop, I did about maybe eight hours plus pretty all right then I the Achilles started to act up on me and then I came back and my wife realized that I was slowing down towards the end part she asked me what's happening I said my Achilles is giving me a bit of problem she asked me do you still want to continue I said let me just sit down here for a while let's see how it goes and then I decided enough I'm not going to push on to make it worse so that one I handled pretty where, well where were you there that was like what 70 miles in or something 100k 100k yeah, yeah. so I still had another 60 plus to go I decided not to push it further to make it worse because I knew I had a few more other races down, uh, down the year. So then, how, and then, how did you respond to that after, after, you know, basically kind of shutting the door on everyone for a now, month after the first one? one this one, you're okay. Yeah, this one I was okay. I uh, handled it better, better because, kind of like mentally, I was prepared mm. that I may have to make this decision because of the Achilles issue, and yeah, yeah I was met, better prepared to handle this emotionally and mentally. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I didn't shut away everyone. I didn't decide to come back the following day. Yeah. That's I guess, I guess, sorry. So I guess I was a bit more matured into ultra running already. So I was a better able to handle this. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so, I mean, the, the experience on Dragon's Back was very different because it wasn't, it wasn't, well, it was physical, but it wasn't a, it wasn't an injury. Yeah. It was just, you know, you, I guess it was sort of mental that you, would, you could push yeah, through it. Yeah, I mean, Dragon's back, the thought occurred, the, th the thought did occur to me yeah. to press the emergency button to be evacuated. But then I, 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 I decided I need to switch off all the emotional attachment and then look at the task at hand and, it's at, and evaluate where I was at that stage. And I said, if I can clear these two hills, I'm back to my support point, I can have a good night's rest and then reassess the following day and I'll push on. So that kind of, the task at hand motivated me to push on uh, the last two hills and then go back to the third day finish line breaking it down yeah. into manageable chunks yeah. Yeah, yeah so that's what i did cool so abby moving on to a few more like quick fire questions yeah. then uh what what makes you emotional ah i don't know i was pondering about this question i don't know i said i really don't know what makes me emotional i mean but how do you how do you feel perhaps at that like how did you feel finishing Dragon's Back? Was that something that you'd, you'd looked forward to doing? The only race I cried was after I finished my TDS. That's why any other races, i never been emotional. I don't know why. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know. My friend got emotional after he finished. Uh, he was yeah. wailing, he was tearing. Yeah. I was happy. I was quite, I was just overjoyed finishing it. I don't know whether I'm just over emotional, but like, I, if anyone watch a video of people running to a finish line or a race on <laughs> Facebook, whatever, I'm just like, oh, I got a lump in my throat. I'm just like, I can't hold back the tears. Um, any, uh, what's been? I suppose what's been your biggest inspiration? My uh, dad, actually. Yeah. My dad. Uh, I say this because my dad is a first generation. I'm second generation. He came from India when he was about what. Uh, 30 plus years old with nothing just a couple of dollars on a ship to Singapore worked his way up opened a business as a tailor 
got married, had me, my two sisters. And yeah, he's my inspiration. But my man who had nothing from India came to Singapore and he's something now. Is have he you, an athlete too? No, nah, no, nah, he's not, he's not. Yeah. Yeah. Have, you, have you raced back in India? Have you done any races no, in never, India? No, never. Okay. Never, yeah. never in India. Maybe for the bucket list. Yeah, yeah maybe. Any uh, any books uh, that you uh, yeah, I'm reading a inspiration book, from? Um, what's it called? Grit. The Power of Passion and Perseverance by Ashley... Ashley Duckwood. Duckwood, Duckwood. Yeah. Interesting, I just started reading. It's about grit, how she defines grit. Interesting. Yeah. And have there been any books that have been really um, inspirational to you in terms of your ultra running career or, or, or even from a work perspective or one that you go to as a, as a source yeah. of inspiration? Not really. I think I like to read books are a bit more factual, like uh, How to Train for Ultra Marathon by Jason Cook. The yep. other one is uh, Uphill Athletic. Uphill Athletic, there's the latest book by Killian. That's the Killian one, yeah, right? Killian's yeah. book. So yeah, these two yeah. books. I like to read a bit more data. That's more the science behind yeah, how science to train behind, for that sort of thing. Yeah, right? those yeah. kind of things. Yeah. So those kind of books. And what about um, what about kit? So you said you were running in Solomon shoes. Ah, that was that. TMBT. What do you, what do you wear now? Ah, uh, uh, North Face. Okay. So I wear North Face now. Uh, quite nice shoes. The new uh, new flight flight series shoes. Pretty impressive shoes. I use them for Dragon's Back. Very good shoes. One pair for the whole five days. Uh, no, I had two pair. One was the uh, Innovate Rock Light Two Seven Five. So I used that for the first day because the terrain was technical. Second day, I went back to North Face. Second, third, fourth day, North Face. Because the sh after the third day, the shoe was just gone. I mean, wet, dirty and everything. And then the last day, I used back the Innovate Rock Light. Yeah. Mm. Any other kit below $100 that you uh, is a go-to for you? T8 Commando. Yes. Ah, yes. Okay. That's a good kit. That's Hong, good. Hong That's Kong's a own good brand. piece yeah. of kit. I used yeah. that for the whole of a dragon's back. I had five five pieces of that. And just purely the sort of underlayer that go under the shorts. Yeah, underlayer and the outer layer. TH shorts and the commando underlayer. These two, yeah. They're brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because of the pockets and everything integrated onto the shorts, it's just brilliant. You just shove everything in. Even the uh, UK guys will. Oh, that's a wonderful, beautiful shot. It's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, they were impressed with that because I was taking out my phone, my map, yeah. my gels and stuff. Oh, that's a wonderful shot, and my wonderful pink color socks as well. <laughs> what are the socks? Uh, Ashmi. Okay. Ashmi. It's a cycling brand, but I think okay. they are trying to venture into yeah. running as well. They're yeah, wonderful yeah. because they're made of merino and carbon. So I didn't get any blisters from it. So five yeah. days I had five different colors. Yeah, they're not f they're not fingers. They're, they're not, not the toe socks. They're sorry. not the toe socks. Yeah, yeah. Not the toe socks. Um, any quotes that you go to? So one of the quote I, I can't remember who said this. So if you're gonna if you're gonna die, like if you're gonna die, do you want to die in a well-preserved state or in a badly bashed up body? So I always go back to this quote. So I say I don't want to die in a well-preserved state. I'm dead. So I'd rather be dead in a bashed up body. Use the body while you have it. Yeah, we'll use the body <laughs> while you have it. My wife thinks I'm crazy. But I think, yeah, that's what I do to me. Do to myself. Abby, you keep yourself in pretty good shape, mate. <laughs> 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 thanks, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> and then what about, um, what's on the list for, for the next year? What are the big... Oh, okay, the big one. I want to go back and do Northburn. Northburn 100 miles. Uh, the other one I'm looking at is uh, Ultra Trail Monte Rosa. Okay. What one's that? Uh, Ultra Trail Monte Rosa by Lizzie Hawker. Okay. Uh, in France. France, yeah, France, I think. Yeah, these two. These two big ones. And what sort of distance is that? 170 one? with about 11,000 meters elevation gain. Around the Alps, obviously, yeah. or is it Pyrenees? Okay. Uh, around the Alps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And these you've got you've got the 230 in yep, Chiang Rai later this year? Yeah, later this year. Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm working up towards there. Is uh yeah you're going to be catching up with Jag up there I'm sure he'll yeah. be uh, he, I think he won that last yeah, year yeah he set he? a record I think 37 hours yeah crazy yeah yeah he's getting faster and faster he just won the H1 this H1, year as well right? yeah H1 yeah, yeah. I think uh, yeah in, in um, below 28, 28 hours. yeah 28 hours yeah yeah I thought yeah. it was 20 24 but yeah no he did 28 hours yeah, yeah which is, but he smashed the field as well yeah, yeah he did amazing yeah yeah interesting. Um, Abby, mate, it's been an absolute pleasure. Really good to have you on, and I'm glad that we uh, uh, we got you on so soon after the Dragons yeah. back. <laughs> and uh, we're actually heading up to Red Dot Running now as well, aren't we? Tomo, Tomo Kazu Yahara Sons in uh, in town. Yeah. 
He's going to be sharing his story of the uh, of um, doing his fun run on the Barclays. But yeah, it'll be good to see a lot of the running crew up there. Yeah, but, we're good. Um, yeah, good to good to have you join us. Good yeah, to thanks see you, for taking Rick. the time, Abby. Thank you, guys. Um, I mean, it's uh, wonderful to sit down here and chat and share how I feel about Dragon's Back, especially. And I hope, I seriously hope, twenty twenty one registration is going to open next year. I hope some crazy Singaporean will sign up for it and get the adventure of their life. Yeah, I think you've set the set the stall out now, and that's what it's about, right? Is inspiring others yeah. to to, and I can sense that from you that you know with the fitness family and it and to inspire us and also with your 400 Gurkhas that, uh, that uh, you work with inspiring them to to do races and stuff as well so yeah hopefully there'll be a few people that sign off off the back and maybe a few people sign up for the four trails uh, next year yeah. after being inspired by your uh, <laughs> your two survival runs thanks Scott cool. thank, Rick. thank you very much guys thanks, cheers, Abby. cheers the end your Ensasia podcast and always tell a truthful story if they ever ask Stop the complaining cause things ain't that bad.